Rosa, do you have any uh, second thoughts about uh, pulling all ground troops out of Iraq, and does it give you pause as, we, as the U.S. Uh, will, is, possibly, is doing the same thing in Afghanistan? Yeah, it, it, you know what, what I just find interesting is uh, the degree to which this, this issue keeps on coming up as if um, this was my decision. All right, well, I'm going to do a give me five on this whole press conference uh, later in the hour, but uh, welcome back. Joining us or rejoining the panel, Lignet Chief Analyst Fred Flights and founder of the Investigative Project on Terrorism, Steve Emerson. And, and Fred, uh, I, I'm very confused because th didn't Barack Obama end the war in Iraq? Didn't Barack Obama bring the troops home? Now he's saying uh, he finds it funny and uh, the, the people bring this up because he didn't do it. It was the previous administration. Uh, what is going on here? It's very frustrating to hear statements like this by the president, Steve. What he also said in that statement is that I, he wanted to leave some troops behind in Iraq. That's sort of the key here. If we left some troops behind, they may have stopped the actions by the Maliki government that led to the sectarian uh, tensions and the rise of ISIS. But he dictated the terms of how the SOFA had to be appro approved, and that was unprecedented, well, and they wouldn't do it. Well, I mean, yes, there was an issue on the status of forces agreement on legal immunity for U.S. troops. But I'll tell you, everyone in Washington knows the Obama administration didn't try very hard to negotiate that agreement. Those agreements are always hard to negotiate. Senator McCain and Senator Graham have harshly criticized the president over the SOFA because they said the president wouldn't even tell the Iraqis how many troops he wanted right. to leave in Iraq. Right. He didn't want an agreement. That's why U.S. troops weren't left behind. He can't blame that on the Baghdad government. Right. Uh, uh, Steve, let me, let, me, let me jump ahead to something uh, that uh, Jim Shuto on CNN said last night. Really, I tweeted it out. I Facebooked it. I couldn't take it anymore. He was talking about how the, the talks between Hamas and Israel, the indirect talks, blah, blah. But both sides are so stubborn. And I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? Both sides are so stubborn. You know what? ISIS is pretty stubborn. Why don't we just sit down with ISIS? while they're, you know, uh, cutting off the, kid, the heads of kids and putting them on sticks outside of parks and say, what do you want? How can we, how can we make this better? Uh, it's just incredible. Are, are you not blown away by this news coverage? Yeah, and why isn't CNN uh, covering uh, the other side in, in the ISIS? You know, right. Why are they covering only the U.S. airstrikes? Why aren't they covering it? You know, when I was at the gym the other day, I saw the font on CNN saying live, and when they're covering the Israel war, uh, Hamas war, live coverage from both sides. And, and they're doing exactly what this administration is doing, which is equating both Hamas and Israel as the same. And somehow that Hamas has, quote, legitimate grievances that only, you know, that, it, that if resolved would solve the entire problem. Nothing could be further from the truth of those morons on CNN are giving safe haven, as this administration is, to Islamic terrorists such as Hamas, which I remind everybody is no different at all than ISIS, ISIL, and Al-Qaeda, except for the fact that Israel has been successful in defending itself. All right, guys. Always love talking to both of you. I'm glad we put the both of you together on the panel. Thank you very much, Fred Flights, founder of, uh, not, not founder, chief analyst for Lignet, and Steve Emerson, founder of the Investigative Project on Terrorism. Thanks to you both. All right, folks, uh, very interesting, and uh, we're going to continue the discussion. And we'll be back with the former CEO of Hewlett Packard, Carly Fiorina, after the break. But first, this hour's American Place takes a look at the Titanic Memorial in Washington, D.C. Don't go away. Women and children first. The orderly commands given that fateful April day in 1912 as the RMS Titanic began to sink after hitting an iceberg. Hours later, over 1,500 passengers and crew had perished in the chilly North Atlantic. The Titanic sinking is well known, but few know of the permanent reminder of this infamous tragedy that stands not far from the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Weeks after the Titanic disaster, a group of American women organized the Titanic Memorial Committee. Soon, women all across the nation tirelessly collected one dollar at a time from grief-stricken Americans who admired the heroism of the brave men who voluntarily gave up their lifeboat seats. First Lady Helen Taft is said to have donated the very first dollar for construction of the memorial. 
Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, of the prominent Vanderbilt family, designed the striking 13-foot-tall male figure with arms outstretched. Carved by Boston sculptor John Horrigan in 1918 from Rhode Island granite, the statue was finally erected in 1930 after 20 years of quarreling over where to put it. Today, it stands overlooking the Potomac River on Washington's waterfront. An inscription reads, to the brave men who perished in the wreck of the Titanic, they gave their lives that women and children might be saved. The Titanic Memorial stands as a monument to the perished and the sacrifice of those who gallantly stepped aside so others would live. For Newsmax TV, I'm Lucy Celia, and this is An American Place.